Lives are changed at Alliance Health Project. Our lives and the lives of our clients. Whether you come for HIV services, sexual health, mental health, substance use, or gender care, you leave here a little stronger, a little more known and seen. And that is healing. Why do people come to AHP? They know we are committed to the highest standard of care, with a heightened sense for race, gender, and sexuality. How that interplay affects our clients, affects all of us. They come because they connect with our staff, who treat them with respect, dignity, and compassion. And that is healing. Alliance Health Project, making the world a better place, one person at a time. Good evening. Welcome everyone to our third art talk, Art for AIDS Art Talk. This one focusing on mixed media and sculpture. I wanna start by saying thank you everyone for all the panelists, um, Sassy Kladpech, Fernando Reyes, Jenny Belayo, Sean O'Donnell, and Michael Beckler are our artists. And we're going to hear from Renee DeCosio and Tom O'Connor, two of our jurors. Um, but before we get started, I just want to say thank you, everyone. I've said this the last two nights, but it continues to be amazing that we have over 200 pieces of art and such generosity and philanthropy, especially in this time when artists are losing shows and studios and um, having such a hard time um, surviving and still showing up and being philanthropic for of the Alliance Health Project. So, so thank you all, all the artists here and all the artists in the auction. Um, and to our jurors who have had just um, an incredible time figuring out how to jury art um, digitally. Um, thank you, we spent many hours, many nights uh, creating what I think is an incredible uh, collection that's available. People are bidding, so um, find, find your, your bidding um, paddle, so to speak, your virtual bidding paddle. Um, and you know, our sponsors again. We're we're just under a hundred thousand dollars in sponsors. And during this time of economic insecurity, we're so grateful to the sponsors and all of you bidders and buyers. Um, thank you, and you know, thank you all for attending. You know, this this year, planning and producing art for AIDS has been a bit of a. Um, we, I like to say we're building the airplane while we're flying it. We just keep putting one foot in front of the other and doing what we ask our clients to do when they're in our care, which is trust the process and um, just keep moving forward one day at a time and showing up. And, and that's what we've done. And um, here we are, and we're really excited about um, what's happening out there in the virtual world and, and certainly at Art for AIDS. We have one more art talk um, tomorrow, focusing on paintings. And then Saturday night is our live auction event at 7 p.m. So I hope you tune in for that. In the meantime, keep bidding. Um, one thing I do want to say, you know, just artists play such a critical role in giving voice to everything that's happening in our society and in our time. And even if it's, uh, if it's an abstract or, or even a flower arrangement, you know, there's still, we're still, um, documenting the times and it's a, they play such an important role in our society. And I feel like um, this marriage between Art for AIDS and um, the artist community is, is really critical. And especially as we're in these double pandemics and uh, also all of the social, uh, the racial and um, transphobia and homophobia. I mean, we're just really, this is such a critical time in our, in our world and in our society. And, um, and, and we're not gonna forget that, but we are gonna focus on art alone for a moment and just try to have some fun and, and, and listen to these amazing artists. So 
Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Renee. Oh, a couple of things just about tonight. We're going to hear from the artist, and then we're going to switch to a panel discussion, and um, and we're going to start with Renee. So take it away. Okay. Well, it's great to be here. Hello, everyone. And um, I'm excited to introduce a couple of artists. Um, first, uh, Jenny Belial. Jenny um, Belial's art practice investigates diverse, interdependent, and symbiotic relationships with natural and man-made environments. Fascinated by alternative realities, disorientation, and flight, she combines disparate experiences to create new narratives, perspectives, and theories. The goal is to identify how patterns and symbols of influence impact perception, social behavior, institutions, history, and truth. She repurposes medium by altering its function to explore identity, ideology, and inequality. As a multidisciplinary artist, Belial's practice incorporates drawings, sculpture, site-specific installations, objects, digital, video, and audio. Inspiration, investigation, research, writing, and discovery dictate the final form. So Jenny, if you if you could please tell us about yourself and your work a little bit. Well, um, I just want to say thank you for Arts for Art Braids and this organization. Um, everything that you do tonight makes a real difference in everybody's lives and also, you know, humanity. It's it's art. And thank you um, for reading my rhetoric and my artist statements. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I think for myself, I, you know, the older I get, the more I believe that as an artist, you know, art is part of your legacy. I do a lot of art advocacy and I believe, I truly believe that everybody deserves one equal chance. And so if I pass away and they put a fork in me and check and see if I passed away or not, it's really about giving back. And with my art practice, I just you know, I've gotten lots of inspiration um, with our current um, president and politics and what's going on. And, and I just am so fascinated by like gaslighting and how people come to their, their realization and how they form these ideas and these perspectives. And so I, I feel like the older I get, I just get guts here with my work. I feel like, you know, there's not much time left and I really want to just you know, share perspectives. And sometimes I've been trolled by people because of my um, political beliefs and my values. But, at, but as an artist, I really feel like, you know, we have to take those risks and we are putting ourselves out into the world. And so I will continue doing that until my last breath. Well, if I may personally thank you for that, um, that's very courageous of you and I admire that and I'm very grateful. And I'm sure many others are too. So that's really neat to know about your work. Um, the other artist I'd like to introduce is Fernando Reyes. He is an artist from Oakland and Somerset who has contributed to Art for AIDS Foundation for many years now. Uh, Fernando started his art career in 1997 by focusing on the human form in painting, printmaking and drawing. And in 2015, Fernando's approach in art making took a new direction in abstract art and hand in abstract art and hand uh, printed paper cutouts that you can see on the screen now. After seeing Matisse's The Cutout exhibition at MoMA in 2014, which was in New York, Fernando has an extensive resume with a large collector base in both corporate and private collections. Fernando's achievements are many, but most notably the Mexican Museum in San Francisco mounted a retrospective of his life's work in 2018. What an honor. It's an honor to have you, Fernando. Can you tell us about yourself and your work, please? Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And um, I'm really happy to be here. I, like, uh, like you said in the introduction, I have been donating to Art for AIDS for many, many years. I don't remember the first year, but I do have to say that this piece, Harbor, um, is actually being donated by one of my collectors, Cynthia Farner. And um, it, this piece was created uh, in 2017 and was included in my very first abstract, abstract show. So starting my career back in uh, 2000, I'm sorry, 1997, when I uh, graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago, 
my main focus was working in figurative art. Um, and so I was pretty much known as being a figurative artist, but um, you know, in 2014, when I went to New York and, and I saw the MoMA exhibition, I was completely overwhelmed by seeing the uh, Matisse cutouts blue nudes. And so I thought, well, you know, this is really interesting because I'm also, I was also getting ready for two solo shows in 2015 and thought, well, I, I really wanted to go in a different direction and sort of want to uh, investigate new ways of uh, working with the figure. And so my, so in 2015, I presented a figurative show uh, in hand printed paper cutouts. So when I say hand printed, I'm talking about uh, as a printmaker, I'm able to print my paper in various designs and patterns using my wood blocks, a lot of my wood blocks that I have uh, in my studio, uh, stenciling, and then also just uh, plain um, solid colors. Uh, so that being my material, I then take that and then create these, uh, these really fun, um, well, initially figurative cutouts. The, as a result of that, I had a lot of, um, uh, a lot of remnants left over from that and trying to figure out what I would do the, with these remnants. Well, in, long story short, that, uh, that then took me into uh, investigating uh, abstraction, which is something that was very, very new to me. And I really had to sort of change my mindset on uh, uh, looking at something visually from the figure to creating something that is really coming out of me from the inner part of me. Um, so anyway, a lot of my work, I think, sort of influenced, uh, not influenced, but it sort of um, uh, echoes back to sort of the mid-century modern period, which is an area that I grew up in. And I remember a lot of the um, designs and patterns of that period. And I continue to go back and look at uh, uh, that information and, and, cre and still now create um, uh, paper cutouts uh, and uh, sort of bring them into more contemporary times. Oh, how interesting. Well, thank you, Fernando. Um, I'm going to um, hand the mic over to Tom, <laughs> fellow juror. Um, hi, Tom. Hi, my name is Tom O'Connor, and I serve on the jury for Art Parades. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Sean O'Donnell. Sean describes his art as the haiku of sculpture. He blends organic shapes of vintage objects to create minimalist sculpture. Sean draws inspiration from the Japanese design aesthetic of wabi-sabi and the elegant simplicity of classical haiku poetry. Sean, can you tell us about the piece that you've donated and how it fits into your larger body of work? Well, yes, and I, I do wanna please start with the fact that I really wanna thank, of course, everyone for uh, the involvement of art parades and the jurors for having me been invited into this show. Um, I, um, th this piece uh, is called Lyrical. Lyrical is um, from a larger body of work called Nonetheless. And it, both, all these pieces find their inspiration from the um, a musical term <laughs> called Ob Obligato, <laughs> the dog. <laughs> um, Obligato. Obligato describes that when a composer tears down a composition to its um, essential elements, uh, where really not a single note is, um, is superfluous. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when Tom says, my art is a haiku of sculpture, what I'm really describing is, um, is a process of reducing the elements that I use in a piece, because uh, really my goal is to reflect minimalism in its purest form. Uh, where I'm able to transform ordinary materials into uh, sculptures of austere elegance. Um, so um, that's, and, and isn't it ironic that I use so many words to describe such a simple piece of art? Uh, 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 that's excellent, Sean. Thank you. Next, I will be introducing Sassy Cladbeth. Uh, Sassy, I have to find my notes here, pardon me. Hello. Hi, Sassy. Hi. Sassy, Sassy uh, grew up and studied in Bangkok before coming here to San Francisco. And she described, she 
her work reflects the beauty of nature that has been hidden in urban living. Sassy, what can you tell us about the piece that you're donating and how it fits into your larger body of work? Yes, so basically my background in Thailand was ceramic. So I have been doing ceramic for more than 10 years. And when I went to San Francisco Art Institute here for a master degree, I want to explore other materials. So I had a background on how to do more, more um, casting in mold. So I start making mold with wood and instead of using ceramic, which like the longer process to get the final piece done, I experimenting with um, concrete and soil and dirt and moss. And most of the inspiration come from architecture and nature. So that is why um, I started with, with these material and then I love it because the process of working is very interesting because it is like a mystery to me, whatever I cast it today, I don't get to see it right away. So I had to wait until like next 24 hours. So when I open up the mall, it's like surprisingly good or it could be like, <laughs> oh man, I wish it's a little bit more moss, you know, reviewing in this area. But it is kind of challenge with working with these material. And the piece that I donate to the donation this year in particular is I'm working with a triangle. So I usually do like square or geometric shape but with the triangle I like the meaning of the triangle it is the strongest shape of all because like all of them are kind of relying to each other so I am an immigrant here living in the U.S. and it is emotionally connect with the triangle because I have my parents uh, back in Thailand so to me it's like like three of us are connected somehow and it, as I said, like it is the strongest uh, shape of also to me, it's like a personal connection to this piece. And I think to bring this piece to us for it is also referring the meaning of family that is very strong connection. So I think it's probably, we all can feel this kind of feeling. Yes. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Beckler. Michael describes his work as colorful forms influenced by his interest in architecture and engineering. Michael, can you elaborate on that and tell us about the piece that you have so graciously donated? Sure, sure. First, uh, like the rest of them, I'd like to say thank you to the jury for uh, letting me be part of this distinguished mixed media group of artists. Uh, a little bit about me, I've been interested in art uh, since a very young child, I've, I've dabbled in everything from ink to watercolors to pastels to oil to uh, resins and glass and paper. And I think that's uh, what you could basically say why I'm a mixed media artist. I have a really hard time just diving into one sort of media and uh, almost uh, uh, every piece I do as I'm creating it, it can end up with all sorts of different aspects of different medias while it's being painted. Obviously I try to start certain, a certain way and have an idea in my, in my mind, but it doesn't always end up that way at the end. Um, as you can also see, if you know my work, I'm really into like patterns and textures um, and I try to implement them. I see things on the street, I take pictures of them, I bring them back to the studio, I look at them and uh, see whether I get some sort of inspiration. And often I don't, but later on down the road, sometimes I'll do a piece and go, well, I can't remember a, a, a pattern like that in the past. And, and sometimes it just comes in later on down the road. Uh, the piece that I uh, gave the jury this year is called uh, Orange Crush. Um, and it's from my more technical graphic sort of work that I do. I kind of work in three different styles. There's some more technical work um, to more, I would, sometimes I work on paper and sometimes I work on resin as it's drying and I paint on top of it, which is always very interesting because the same thing, you never really know till the next day what it's gonna look like, which is always kind of fun. Uh, it's like Christmas every time I do it. Uh, and sometimes a bad Christmas, sometimes a good Christmas. Um, but this piece um, harkens back to when I was a child. I don't know if you remember, you probably have to be my age or close to my age. Remember when uh, you go to the doctor's office and it'd be a big bowl of uh, hard candy sitting on the, on the desk or at your grandmother's house, you see a big bowl of hard candy on the, you know, the dining room table. Um, and 
So what I try to create with this sort this whole series, which is called Candyland, is uh, that when you look at the piece, you almost feel the flavor, like the orange. You know, I, I'm hoping that someone will look at that and go, "Wow, I remember how, about taking a bite out of an orange or something like that." So I've kind of cr tried to create through art candy slash flavor when you look at a piece. Um, I'm not sure if I accomplished it, but that was the idea. Um, I also have to say I've been lucky enough to be uh, noticed by some good art influencers. I'm currently showing in three different galleries permanently. And um, I have to say the one I'm most proud of is uh, Art House here in San Francisco. A little plug for them. Um, another exciting thing that happened about a couple years ago was I was interviewed by Travel Channel China and I had an episode that aired all over Asia and it started getting me some work in uh, Asia and I started selling work in Asia. And I actually went to Japan and met with a gallery in, in Tokyo and we started talking and about the time we were starting to get positive about it, um, COVID hit and they've now decided that they're not going to open the gallery and the couple are gonna move back to London. So thank you COVID. Um, uh, let's see, also just to, just, a, just at an ender, you know, uh, I started becoming really serious about art about 20 years ago and the people that I've met um, and been able to become friends with the creative types that have just been uh, a, a really good breath of fresh air. And I have to say the, especially the, the artists at 1890 Bryant, um, there's such creative artists here. Sometimes it's intimidating, but I think it also pushes you to do art that you're trying to be proud of. So with that said, I think I've used my two minutes. Um, but uh, at the end, I just want to say, uh, get online, bid for art. Artists have gave their art out of love and there's never been a more uh, positive time to give money for um, Alliance Health Project than now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so we're gonna open it up to p the panel discussion now. Tom has got his question ready, I can see. And, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Thank you, everyone. It's so rich to hear you talk about your work. It's really, um, it just adds such a great context. So thank you. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that we are taking Q&A. So for the uh, attendees, there's a little, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can type questions. So while Tom and Renee are asking the artist questions or the discussion is happening, occasionally I'll just chime in with a question from the audience. All right, go for it. All right. So I'm curious with the mixed media artists. Uh, it's interesting to me that so many, uh, well, like Sassy, it looks like a lot of the things that you're using are things maybe that you're finding on the street and incorporating into your work. And then uh, I feel like Sean is doing the same thing. Where do you find the materials for your work? Where did I find the yeah. material? So to me, I use um, soy and dirt. So usually I just dig someone backyard. Oh. <laughs> I, true, I asked all my friends if I, if I can come to all their neighbors, like backyard or something. But I started a series that uh, wherever I travel, I try to bring a small tube with me and then I snuck some soy back in the U to do to the US. So please don't tell the, you know, like the declaration <laughs> center. So, but with the moss and twig, I usually gather it from the neighborhood. Like when I went to Napa and I saw them, just on the side of the street, I just pull over and gather them, a lot of them. And also last year that uh, the big fire in the Northern California, I also uh, pick up some wood and twigs from there because it's like kind of like a material that I work with too. So I made the, I created a series with like a charcoal black material that I got from the burnt wood. Yes. Nice. Tom? Cool. Um, my, my answer is very simple to the extent that Everything that I've done over the last, uh, I don't know, half a dozen or more years, the material that you see on the wall behind me or anything that I've donated to Art Parade, or anything in my body work, all comes exclusively from the Alamany flea market. Mm. It's just, you know, there's just so much there. It's so rich. And I buy things that I have no idea what I'm going to do anything with until one or two years later when it finally 
pops into my head that that would be really neat to do something with that. So that's that, that's my source. So these things, they are tools or things that you're taking apart. Like what what are some of those things? Well, for example, the piece that I donated this year, lyrical, the uh, the uh, primary shape of the instrument, as I call it, is a uh, fly casting net. And then the long neck and the head is a uh, pruning saw. And the strings, you know, the, uh, effectively the strings are carbon fiber rods. And that little ring in the middle is from a Tunisian olive tree. All from the flea market. Very interesting. Thank you. I may ask. Um, so I'm finding there's a certain amount of spontaneity in everyone's work here and working with mixed media. And so I think I'm gonna zero in on Jenny right now. Um, I know your work from several years ago, Jenny, and you were painting these large atmospheric, beautiful paintings and there were different types of paints and pigments and such. And now I see your work now. And I guess my question for you would be, um, as a painter and there's that part of the process, you don't know how it's gonna turn out exactly and you're, you're in it. What's, how do you go from that to where you are now? And um, is there spontaneity? What's the difference in the spontaneousness in that type of process and work you were doing then and now? Uh, I think that's, I think I can answer that in multiple parts. And when I went to graduate school, I felt like there weren't that many options. I was always a multidisciplinary artist, but the options were your painter or your painter. Mm -hmm. And so I took that track and I was always doing my multidisciplinary work, but that necessarily wasn't the track for galleries as much. And so I, the older I got, I felt more confident to really explore the practice that I've always been doing at my studio. Uh, um, I also had um, developed a severe allergic reaction to oil paints. So I had to stop it for physical re reasons. And um, so I think not only was it a physical reaction, but also I felt like I really was not doing the work that I wanted to do for multiple reasons, that institutional, what my choices were, the physical part, but um, as a painter, I think, it, how do they relate conceptually? Mm -hmm. You know, I always, I always think that, I always come up with an idea because I'm a writer and I do lots of writing because I'm an educator and I do a lot of advocacy work. But I always feel like you have to capture that idea right away. And sometimes the practice that you've trained in is not the best way to employ that idea. Mm -hmm. And so you have to sort of say, you know what? I've been trained in this, but that's not going to be the most effective way to really come across with that concept. And so you have to sort of like sit back and say, you know what, I have to really do what is the best for that idea. I want to just jump in for a moment because we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Mike, you mentioned engineering and had a significant influence. How much of the influence um, has your career had on for over you over the years? It sounds like this person knows you as a... <laughs> um, yeah, I have to say engineering uh, has a lot to do with my work. I would say that my more detailed graphic work is kind of how I started and kind of where I started to become noticed up from. Um, and through time, um, I found myself uh, similar to Jenny. I, I kind of got bored with doing the same sort of style and maybe it's kind of hurt me through the years because I've not really been, uh, like you said, galleries like to see a certain type of uh, design, a certain type of branding, I guess you would say as an artist. Um, and over and over again, they like to see that style. But they want the, you know, people to come in and go, oh, that's a, that's a Mike Beckler or that's a, you know. So um, uh, engineering had a lot to do with it. And even the stuff that looks like more free flowing that I do um, is, there's lots of uh, chemistry involved with it because when I pour on resin, I add different elements to my uh, paints or pigments to get them to dry faster or dry slower. And so that they come out in a different, different pattern uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, like I said, it takes like 24 hours, sometimes longer, 
for them to all to dry. It's, some take like up to three days, depending on how much additive I put in, if I want to slow the process of the paint as it dries in order to get a different effect on, on the piece. So yeah, engineering has had a big effect on, on my work. And then Sean, one more question since uh, I'll just jump in and then maybe Renee, you, I see that I, you were just about ready to go. Um, about it's, This question is about your interest in music and whether, you know, where that originated from. It sounds like this piece, lyrical, and many of your pieces are musical instruments. Uh, growing up with music in my, uh, my childhood home, there was a piano, Korean, ukulele, um, harmonica, I mean, just everything, everything around us uh, as kids were, was music. Uh, of course, you know, um, 78 records <laughs> going way back there. So you know, there's always, always music. And I've been a, a musician in a small way uh, with my beloved tenor ukulele over here on the wall uh, for years. And so uh, it, it's always music in my life. Mm. Thank you. Um, speaking of the, the form of the guitar and ukulele and so on, um, I think of Fernando Reyes, um, his forms, his figures are incredible. You're, the way you can draw the human figure um, is really uh, impressive. And um, I don't know if you are familiar with his works, but I, I recommend you look them up because you really have a, a, a way of drawing that um, I think is very striking. But I want to ask you this. Um, so if you're drawing the human figure and you have something to look at realism and you're, you're going off of that and then you go to abstract work, do, is it difficult or, or do you find another place in yourself where that you, you tap into or is it the same place or how do you go about the two different? Yeah. Uh, well, in, in 2000, 15, um, in January, I specifically remember I was working on uh, what I would consider to be my, probably my very first uh, uh, large abstract piece. And I was having the most difficult time trying to figure it out. Um, but, and I didn't realize that um, what I was doing, it, it was creating something that, uh, that is coming out of me and not necessarily from something I'm actually observing, observing, like the figure. Mm -hmm. So I was having the hardest time with that, and uh, decided that I had to set it, set it aside, and for at least a couple of months, and just keep looking at it every single day, and trying to figure out, well, how do I approach this? Because I, I, I determined that I can't just go in there and draw, or well, I can't just go in there and create something like I can with the figure, because I've got something I'm looking at where now I don't. I've got to now think internally and find out, well, where is this abstraction coming from? Why am I so interested in it? Because honestly, I didn't have much interest in abstraction until, uh, until I saw the show of uh, Matisse. And, and that sort of sparked something inside me that uh, I felt like I really needed to start thinking about perhaps expanding sort of my repertoire. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is I was also, I didn't want to peg myself, I think at that point, as a figurative artist because most people were considering me a figurative artist uh, because of my work, um, which I still work with a figure when I can, uh, but I, I gotta be honest, I don't as much as I'd like to, um, but that's only because I'm so busy with the abstract work and I'm having an incredibly great time with it. And I think I figured it out. Um, uh, because since since uh, 2015, I've actually had a really nice um, response to my work, and uh, it's it was just so something I had to work out internally in my brain somewhere. Something sparked, and uh, what that was, I don't know, but whatever it was, I'm glad I found it, and it's taken me to a place where I'm just having uh, an incredibly fun time creating these pieces. And right now, what I'm working on is actually not abstraction, although I'm trying to bring a little bit of ab abstraction into it. I'm, I'm actually talking to you right now from my new studio in Somerset up in the Sierra foothills. Uh, I still have a studio in Oakland in Jingletown uh, and I will continue to have that studio at least for another year, if not longer. 
Uh, but I'm now going to start creating all of my work up here in Somerset, uh, where my husband and I bought a home uh, a little over two years ago. I just renovated this garage work uh, workspace uh, into a studio, and um, I I. I'm being inspired by this property that we bought, which is a 10 acre property. And I'm completely surrounded by oak trees uh, and uh, pine trees. And uh, in, in the spring, uh, the flowers that bloom in my garden, we have two gardens, uh, a lot of irises. Um, so the inspiration for my next show, which actually opens on the 23rd, uh, in October at Mercury 20 in Oakland is called This Land. And it's all inspired by my land here in, in, uh, the, in the uh, uh, Sierra Foothills. And there'll be basically uh, paintings, uh, printmaking and uh, paper cutouts. Wow, that's so exciting. And I'm, I'm excited to watch your work and the trajectory and um... <laughs> So that shows on the 23rd, it opens in October. So great, thank you. This is very exciting, very nice. Thank you. We have um, one more question that just came in. Um, how many of you or are any of you um, inspired by uh, data collage art? Um, are you, or, you know, found objects, are you influenced? by found objects. Do you think uh, many mixed artists, mixed medium artists might be? Jenny, you got, it looks like you got, yeah, jump in. I, you know, I, I just taught contemporary art history and theory at UC Berkeley Extension. And um, I was gonna be teaching a class on social political artists from 1918 to current day, you know, each year inflection. And I think it's impossible to not be somehow influenced by the artists that paved the path for you, ahead, you know, in, in front of you. So I would say, yes, um, I think it's how you bring it into a current contemporary context, which is really important. And you, in, you know, also infuse your human ex experience into that history. <clears throat> I have to say, yeah, I mean, I've been influenced also by artists in the past. I have two favorites. And during these COVID times, based on the fact that I'm not out and about as much as I used to and getting inspiration like I used to, um, I kind of went back and started looking at some of my favorite artists that kind of positioned me into kind of where I, the direction I went into as when I first started to really take it serious. Um, one of them was Enrico Donati. I don't know. Um, specifically is really late work where he would, he was kind of out there a little bit, but he was great. He would take uh, uh, his vacuum cleaner bag apart and he would take the, the sand and the dust and the lint and whatever he could find and make really cool creative texture in his work. His work was pretty dark at the end, but it was, the texture was incredible. Um, and then um, I've also been looking through my pictures. I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Barcelona where I studied Gaudi. Um, his architecture and the dimensions and the colors probably had a, had a huge effect on my work. Anybody who knows Gaudi or been to Parc Duval in, in Barcelona can see sort of aspects of those colors um, uh, in my work. I mean, so yeah, I've been influenced by great people in certain ways. Very interesting. Okay, anyone else or how, how are you all doing? Like how, how is it, is COVID a, um, impacting or changing your work or? Um, yeah, do you have work that's coming out of this time? I, I, I don't mean to break in again, but yeah, COVID had a huge effect on my, on my work. I mean, I have to say the first few months I, I was, I, I don't know, I didn't do a whole lot. My creativity went to nothing. Um, and then I started to, I was at home and um, I started uh, painting or sketching um, just because I needed to do something. And I started doing a series of skulls. I ended up doing a series of 16 painted like bright colorful skulls. I don't know where it came from, um, but, but nonetheless, I don't know. I think somehow COVID had some sort of weird effect on me do, you know, all of a sudden 
thinking about mortality or something. I don't know. And I started painting skulls. Well, well for me, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, why don't you go ahead? No, you go ahead first. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, for me, COVID hasn't stopped me at all. In fact, I, I've been busier than hack uh, creating art. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that it has done uh, mostly I've been sheltering in place up here in the Sierra foothills. So <clears throat> uh, one of the things that it's done is uh, it's, it's sort of advanced a lot of our plans uh, of what we wanted to do here in the property. And my studio was one of them. Uh, I wasn't planning on, on actually renovating this building until probably next year. But uh, since I am spending so much time up here and not so much in my studio in Oakland, I felt like, um, I, I still need to create art. And so I thought, well, I might as well just get the studio ready for me now. And so that was a positive thing. Although, um, you know, uh, everything that I had planned for the year just went away, uh, like with everyone else. So I had to make the best of it. And I think I've, um, I kept myself extremely busy and, uh, it's, you know, I'm, um, I'm, just t embracing what I have now uh, based on, you know, the situation we are with COVID. Sassy, you were yeah. gonna jump in. Yeah, so to me, um, COVID has like affected me, especially at the beginning, because I had my studio down on Market Street and then it was locked down and then they were not allow anyone to get even get into the studio. But during that we were about to move out from that studio because they were demolishing the area for like luxury apartments. So they kicked every artist in the building out. So I was in the middle of like packing and about to move. So it is really hard since I'm working with dust. So it's kind of hard to work at home. So I just turned my kitchen into my studio a little bit, start casting thing in the kitchen, put all the food and the dishes away and then just set my station. So. I've been making a smaller scale of work and I don't know if you can see it's a little bit like far over there. So basically like casting some like smaller scale and then I wanted to do a series of these in a wood white panel and then kind of like more like a smaller size of installation. So that is what I'm working on. It's like inspired by the COVID situation that forced me to. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, COVID has just continued. You know, I, most of the artists that I know because of the work I've done um, volunteering, we're, you know, artists are creatures that we're used to being in our cave, you know, <laughs> we're like, you know, we're already alone, you know, we're already in there. If you're, you know, we're so focused and laser focused on our practice. Um, I think what COVID has done is probably not an unhealthy thing where I've become more of a workaholic than I already was. <laughs> Um, so the life balance issue is out of way, you know, out of sync. But I think what COVID has done is just, you know, for me, it just is, it's a complete, um, you know, huge barrel of information that I can use for my art practice and research. I'm going to, we, you know, I'm aware that we're, we were trying to keep these to um, a half hour, but it's impossible because it's so interesting to hear from you. Um, but I did want to ask one last question um, before we wrap up. And that is, you know, why, why you, there's so many amazing and important causes. Why Art for AIDS? What about this organization or this auction? inspires you to give and I see Sean you are you're like I I got I got this one <laughs> well it's it, it, honestly it's very very simple um going back to the late 80s and early 90s um uh, unfortunately as, uh, the, the good part is that I was involved uh, back then with uh, an artist community the unfortunate part is many of those wonderful creative people um uh, simply succumbed to AIDS. And so I uh, said goodbye to way too many people, probably over a dozen people in a handful of years in the late 80s, early 90s. And so Art for AIDS really hits home uh, for me uh, as an artist, even though I have not been a practicing artist that long, but uh, it really hits home. So that's, that's where my money and my heart goes. 
Well, I moved to San Francisco in 1976. So I was in, here at, in the very beginning of art for AIDS. I'm sorry, of, of the AIDS period. And uh, uh, when I, I don't, like I said, I don't remember when I was approached regarding art for AIDS many, many years ago. And uh, obviously it's such a great organization. And uh, because I just remember so much from that period, so many of my friends have passed because of it. And I still have many friends today that are living with HIV. Um, it's, it's such an important organization. And uh, I feel like it's important to give if you can. And, uh, and this is a great way of doing it. Yeah, I, I'd say it's similar. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area. I watched the AIDS crisis happen. Um, I lost multiple friends, uh, very creative people that I knew. Um, and then uh, my friends that, that survived and have become positive since. I've watched them deal with the complexities of becoming um, HIV positive. Um, and the mental health issues that are attacked, attacked that. Um, and so, yeah, I've been, I've, and I've had, and for specifically Alliance Health Project, I've had multiple friends that have gotten help through Alliance Health Project. And so it's a no brainer for me to do whatever I can with it. Yeah, I think um, the reason I donated is the fact that. Um, the organization, they talk the talk and they walk the walk. And I've had a studio in the Tenderloin, West Oakland, I'm now in Richmond. And this, the legacy of this organization, they really, it goes back to the people that need the help. And I think that that sometimes gets missing when I get asked all the time for, will you donate the work? And that's one of the reasons I really respect this organization. You know, there's a lot of staff on the call right now, so I bet you they just love hearing that because <laughs> <laughs> they, they are out there in the front lines doing really, really amazing work. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I want to, before we sign off, I do want to also point out that, you know, Mike is also, uh, has been on the jury, has been on the host committee, has helped us raise money. Sean is there with his tool belt, hanging the show every year. You know, Tom has gotten us just mad. I mean, everyone has been involved in so many ways and um, come, Renee to Renee and, and Rhett hanging shows. I mean, it's just really um, years of, of knowing you and those of you who are new, it's so great to know you now and we welcome you to our Alliance Health Project Art for AIDS family and hope that you'll, um, you'll stay connected. And to the attendees, I want to say, you know, thank you all for coming and listening. We're um, we're going to sign off, but the the bidding is is open. If you're interested in any of these pieces, many have bids, so you you can it, you know go have some fun, bid over your friends, um, bid over strangers, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and we'll see you Saturday night at the at the live event. And um, thank you all so much for for this little moment. I really appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Not the nuances in my work is in relationship of form and color. It's about San Francisco and change and the layers that are in all the buildings that give us the narratives of the city. I always seem to find myself in coming of age series. It's about being between two states and that moment where you're sort of neither here nor there. I love to kind of bring in that it's sort of spontaneity at the same time as deliberate. But there's just something so life-affirming about it. Um, so that's really why I do it. <laughs>